exciting stuff going on in the adventure world at the moment and on the Explorers Connect website. We've launched the, the new website about five months ago. Um, we want some feedback and we're also giving away um, seven days of rations. So from leaving the Marines, got my rucksack, a little bit of travelling for, for a few years around Africa, India, Southeast Asia and it really got my appetite going for some extreme adventure. After about three years of travelling, totally broke, hadn't got pennies for a name, I thought, you know what, I want to set up something where I can train people up to have the confidence to go anywhere in the world. So I set up elite survival training. Within the UK, I run survival courses, sometimes for schools, sometimes for corporate companies, sometimes for production companies that are wishing to go that further bit of the field into deep jungles or deserts. But more interestingly, I get hired by production companies who come up with a concept idea, most of the time it's pretty crazy, and they say, John, can you go to the middle of nowhere and research this subject and put the program together? About two years ago, I sat at home in Northampton, dinner on my lap, watching EastEnders, bored out of my head watching Stacey Slater, and I thought, I need to have an adventure. And lo and behold, about eight o'clock at night, the phone went, and it was a production company in London that networked through. This is hi John, we understand you've been to Papua New Guinea before. I've previously been there to do Last Man Standing Extreme Dreams. He said, we've got an idea, we've got a subject that we want to investigate and we'd really like you to go out there and look into it for us. I said, well what's the subject? He said, it's cannibalism. We would like you to find a guy called Tiddy Kawa from the Badomini tribe who's responsible for mass genocide and has eaten many, many people. <laughs> and he said, are you in or are you out? I looked at EastEnders, I looked at the dinner, I thought about it four to ten seconds, and I thought, I am totally in. Now you, you probably all know where Papua New Guinea is, second largest island in the world, just above Australia, and it's in fact split in half. You've got Papua New Guinea and West Papua. Now, I had to find this guy called Tidakawa. It was filmed in 1968 by an anthropologist. And I was given the black and white grainy DVD from some dusty archives, and I watched it. And no one knew where this chap lived. No one even knew he was still alive. I soon found that the Badomini were a world apart from everyone else. You're talking about a part of the world that's inaccessible by car, by road, and only recently, it's been accessible by a plane. And these guys are still going around with hugs through their noses, bows and arrows, living off the land, totally unaware of the outside world. Before I went in, I prepped the kit. In it, everyday items, items that I might use if I'm caught without my rocks, like my toothbrush, antibacterial soap, medical kit, hammock, sleeping bag. But what I found is the community, the kids, just like our kids would be out, get into mischief, playing sport, and everyone again very friendly. But the big difference of life, as a community, all the ladies would go out and process sago, collect, cutting down uh, huge trees and then processing it. And then as a community again, equally sharing those meals out. And that for me was phenomenal, because as neighbours, as we live in our tiny little houses, we keep ourselves ourselves. But as a community for these guys, everybody shared everything. Predominantly, the locals are vegetarians, okay? They now live in these set places, all right? They all live in these set places. They've hunted all the game around for miles and miles and miles. Pretty much all the wild pigs, deers, birds, they've, they've all gone. It's like, Benny, when's the last time you had meat? Two months ago. He's got these two birds to feed four children, himself and his wife as well and he was chuffed to bits and then that's when the so started seeing it's like okay so you don't have meat on a regular basis it's like no once in the blue moon <laughs> predominantly though if they do have meat they might have a cassowary bird this is one that they've reared themselves but whilst i was there they did catch a wild one now i've been here for about four days now and i've warmed to the locals the locals are warm to me and I now know my intentions is to really research what cannibalism is really about. Have you ever eaten human flesh? I was kind of bricking it. I was like, and they just laughed at me. And they said, yeah, we have, John. What's the big deal? Have you ever eaten chicken? I was like, yeah. 
And I said, well, <laughs> for these guys, before 1972, cannibalism mm -hmm. was a very, very common occurrence. There's lots of different reasons why they did it between tribes, but these guys, the Samo people near Honanabe, they only did it when other tribes, like the Badomini, used to come down and raid their villages. The Badomini used to come down, okay, once in a blue moon, and deliberately kill them for their flesh. These guys would defend their long houses with their women and children, with their lives, and anyone that was caught and dead, like, well, why waste the meat? The enemy's gone, why waste it? So backpack on, I now need to start making my way towards Tidikawa. I need to get to Mogalu. To give you an idea though, I've now been in the jungle for about 10 days. What happened next is probably one of the most incredible things that's ever happened to me, in all honesty. Get to the village, and normally when you walk into villages you see people milling around, kids playing. But when I get here, there's no one. I'm like, my senses pick up, but I'm too sure what's going on now. And I get there and I said, John, just wait to go in that longhouse on your own. I'm now being led to meet Tidikawa. Oh! 